This is Radio 4. Now we begin a new series of What If, in which the Cambridge historian Dr Christopher Andrew rewrites some of the dramatic moments in recent British history. To begin this second series of What If, we go back to one of the most dramatic moments of the last decade, the Falklands War. The conflict was all over in less than two and a half months. The Argentinians invaded the Falklands on the 2nd of April 1982 and surrendered on the 14th of June. The shooting war had lasted just 41 days. In the long afterglow of patriotic pride which followed an epic British campaign, victory often appeared to have been inevitable. At the time, however, while the task force was sailing towards the Falklands, 8,000 miles from home, the campaign seemed likely to be a desperately close-run thing. Never more so than on the 4th of May, when this news came from the Ministry of Defence spokesman, Ian MacDonald. In the course of its duties, within the total exclusion zone, HMS Sheffield, a Type 42 destroyer, was attacked and hit late this afternoon by an Argentine missile. The ship caught fire which spread out of control. It is feared that there have been a number of casualties, but we have no details of them yet. Next of kin will be informed first as soon as details are received. Even greater dangers loomed on the horizon. What if one of the two aircraft carriers, Hermes or Invincible, had been hit? What if either of the troop carriers, Canberra or the QE2, had gone down? With me to discuss what might have happened if the Falklands campaign had turned out differently are the Task Force Commander, Admiral Sir John Woodward, better known as Sandy Woodward, and the editor of The Times, Simon Jenkins, who in 1982 was political editor of The Economist and who wrote with Max Hastings an authoritative account of the war and its political impact. Admiral... On the way down to the Falklands, what did you actually know about the opposition that you were going to be up against? Very little. Um, I'd met some of them. Indeed, I'd been the captain of Sheffield, the destroyer Sheffield, in 1977, and we were alongside the first of their similar kinds of destroyers, helping them put their systems to work. So we knew them quite well, and they knew us quite well. Uh, as far as actual information, the, the type of... Um, detailed military information you need that was largely limited to those two major publications called Jane's Fighting Ships and Jane's Air Forces of the World, I think it is. So those were the things that you actually read on the way down to the Falklands? Yes. Then again, of course, we knew quite a lot about the equipment they had because, of course, in some cases it was the same equipment as ours, so they knew quite a lot about ours as well. And their aircraft we were fairly familiar with because they were predominantly American. You approached the problem from the basis of, well, we'll prepare ourselves as well as we can for whatever may happen, if only we knew, uh, within the limits of the equipment and time we've been given. Uh, that said, you also made a list in your own mind of what you felt were what the Americans would call mission-critical um, items in your inventory, your military inventory. And very early on, I think it was very clear to us that if we didn't have airfields in the south, um, we couldn't manage either ashore or at sea if otherwise you have no ability to protect yourself from air attack. Therefore, airfields were essential. We had none within easy range of the Falklands. We didn't have control of the one on the Falklands. All we had, therefore, were two mobile ones, Hermes and Invincible, the two aircraft carriers. And they had to be mission-critical units. And in fact, losing Hermes, I would be inclined to say, would certainly have altered the outcome of the war. Losing Invincible would most probably have done so. Invincible had about half the aircraft carrying capability of Hermes. Simon, what do you think the most likely way that the Argentinians could have won would have been? The most likely way they could have won would have been for them to have persuaded the Americans to stay totally neutral uh, from day one um, and denied the British the refueling in ascension to have denied the British supplies, particularly the new missiles, and um, to have denied the British at least the vague sense of security that should things go badly wrong, the Americans would come to their help or our help. 
So I think their first strategy, which they played with some aplomb uh, before the war broke out, and played with some desperation even during it, was certainly a critical issue. Uh, subsequent to that, clearly they had to score a military victory. They had to sink British ships. Um, they had to maintain air superiority over the islands. They had to um, maintain the resupply of the islands and defeat the British troops on the islands. That fell to good soldiering. Uh, that's where they fell down very seriously. But militarily speaking, uh, and I was in America for, for a while at the time, talking to analysts there, they simply couldn't see how the Argentinians could possibly lose. Well, the Argentinians clearly made a series of mistakes in the course of the campaign. Sandy, what do you think they would have had to have done to end victorious as opposed to defeated? They failed to see, and I don't know for what reason, that there were various areas that they could ruin our day with. One was to take out a carrier. I think they did see that, but they perhaps didn't go about it the right way. The other was to identify the Sea Harrier Force as our only fighter protection, and perhaps to know that we only had 34 aircraft in the country of that kind, and to concentrate on shooting them out of the sky. They, instead, they tried to attack the ships, whereas they ought to have taken out the air power first. And you do that either by taking the deck away from underneath the aeroplane or the aeroplanes out of the sky. When you only have a total inventory of 34 facing an air force of over 200 combat aircraft, it should be possible, but it proved that they didn't go for it. Let, let's first get clear one, one technical um, point. I, I don't want to send you to the bottom of the ocean without knowing how it was done. How could the Hermes have been sunk? Oh, I think there are several ways. For instance, uh, Exocet is a missile to be taken seriously. There were, I believe, eight Exocet missiles in each of two destroyers accompanying the Belgrano down to the south of the Falklands on the 1st, 2nd of May. And there were, I imagine, 10 A4 Skyhawks on board the Argentinian carrier the 25th of May uh, up to the north on the night of the 1st, 2nd. Um, the combination of those two groups of ships and aircraft with their missile systems, if they had really pushed forward that night towards us, they could well have sunk the Hermes in the melee that would have ensued. We had very imperfect surface surveillance for the battle group, uh, and we had one SSN in contact with the Belgrano group, as you know. Uh, in fact, it wasn't Belgrano so much as her accompanying destroyers that were the real threat to the battle group that I was in. So it could all have happened on the night of the first, second, or second, third. There are two possibilities, clearly, if the Hermes had gone down. One, that we would have won, but it would have been a good deal more difficult, in fact, very much more difficult. But the other possibility is that we would have lost. Simon Jenkins, do we accept a defeat, accept that uh, the Falklands are now the Malvinas, or do we refuse to make peace? What do we do? Well, I, I personally think that the scenario that we've sketched, which has the British unable to proceed with a landing, um, would have had uh, the British returning to the Ascension Islands, uh, and w presumably from the Ascension Islands back home, uh, you would have had an appalling political crisis, and I imagine uh, you would have had the government having to resign. Um, and that was the measure, the full measure, of the gamble that mm -hmm. Mrs Thatcher took. Uh, many of her advisers thinking it was a reckless gamble, but then you want your, your leaders to be lucky, not necessarily competent, um, and uh, Angie indeed won. Uh, I, I do think it's interesting to look, however, at halfway points, because there was no doubt that the Americans were worrying a lot about what they might have to do if the British lost enough ships to make a landing difficult, but not so many as to make the British turn around and sail home. And indeed, uh, there were plenty of people in America who would have been shocked to have seen the British turn around and sailed home, simply because what it would have indicated for aggression and dictatorship around the world. I mean, an another repeat of the Kuwait incident, in a sense, or a preview of the Kuwait incident. And I have no doubt at all that the Americans were ready uh, to come to our aid. And if Hermes had gone down, they would have sent a carrier eventually. Sandy. It certainly wasn't in any way part of our contingency planning out there. It may have been back home, for all I know, uh, for such, a, such an eventuality. Uh, like an American carrier coming to replace one of ours if it was lost. Our main concern was to get Illustrious out of build in, in uh, Newcastle. The, sta the stage that the, 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 the negotiations had reached, of course, were that they'd, uh, they had actually assigned a carrier. Had they? They had, um, so to speak, put it on, on standby should anything ghastly happen. Uh, 
But of course, the one thing they were not yet ready to do was to, to put American uh, troops aboard it. So there was a terrific discussion as to whether they could realistically give the British a carrier, which was manned by the British. In other words, literally give us a replacement carrier, which wasn't realistic. And I think at the point that these discussions reached, uh, the war became uh, more or less a foregone conclusion. But there's no doubt at all that, that I mean, the, the very highest American officials will tell you this now, I think. Uh, there's no doubt at all that they were prepared to face the horrible prospect that their closest and most loyal ally was going to suffer a thundering military defeat. Supposing that um, Hermes had gone down and that you hadn't gone down with your ship, how would you have sought to continue the war? Well, uh, we first of all have to say when did it happen. If it hands, happens before the landing is made, uh, that's one set of problems. You, you probably do not recommend pursuing the war without an American carrier coming up into the front line. There's no question of being British man. We wouldn't have had the people to do it, much less been able to operate their equip equipment that fast and efficiently. So it has to be an operational American carrier, straight out of fleet service. So there's no question of it being half a commitment by the Americans, it's a total commitment by them, which is why I don't believe it was ever seriously planned. But that's another matter. Uh, that would have been the way, military way forward. Um, before the landing, however, it is perfectly feasible to turn the soldiers around, the land forces around, the marines in particular, and sail them back. After the landing, it is much, much more difficult, because to reverse a landing is just as difficult, even not, if not more so, because you're now doing it under unfavourable circumstances, that's why you're doing it. Uh, and I think the size of the catastrophe involved in getting back off again, if that was the decision, the military decision taken, would have been very considerable, difficult to do. So the loss of Hermes before the landing, it, yes, it means you don't repossess the Falklands by military means, whatever else you do. Uh, the loss of the Hermes afterwards means that you probably suffer a major military defeat at the same time. Simon, what would the political fallout have been from the, the loss of the Hermes? Well, you have some measure of it from the loss of the Sheffield. Um, I, I gather that the, uh, the meeting of the War Cabinet after the loss of the Sheffield was one of the most genuinely shell-shocked events in the whole war. And as someone said, it just shows how emotional um, are the responses, even of the most rational politicians, to bad news. Um, they suddenly went from thinking, this is going to be easy, whatever they said, what was in their hearts, they thought this was going to be easy, to thinking this is going to be a disaster. The loss of one ship. Now, uh, ha had you lost the Hermes, I'm quite sure that would have been magnified many times, uh, as indeed was Mrs. Thatcher's own emotions when she thought the SBS unit had been lost on South Georgia. I mean, all these, I mean, bad news is exaggerated and good news is exaggerated in time of war. Um, so I think it would have been bad news whether the loss of one unit would have led to a uh, dash for, for the cliff edge, I very much doubt. I mean, I think they would have settled down. They would have tried to work out whether this really does mean that a landing is impossible um, or if the landing has taken place, where, whether the, the landing should be aborted. Um, and I think at the end of the day, uh, given the fact that you've posited just one unit being lost, I think they would probably have decided on the basis of advice they got from the command um, to proceed and uh, and uh, merely tell the Americans not to be so wet and to continue to keep the, the fuel flowing to Ascension Island. Talk us through, if you would, the first meeting of the War Cabinet after the defeat. By defeat you mean after the decision to withdraw. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think the War Cabinet would have taken the view that they have got to submit themselves to a vote of confidence in the House. Well, I think they would have been forced to do so anyway. Um, I think you would have had a truly horrendous meeting of the 1922 committee that evening, uh, at which I think m Mrs. Thatcher, who was not lacking in honour in these matters, um, would have felt that, uh, that, I mean, she would have listened to what was said at that one meeting. She would then have called in the chief whip, and I think she would have taken the view that she should step down. She resigns. What happens next? Um, I have to think myself back to the various candidates for the leadership. Um, but I think you would have got uh, almost certainly a caretaker leader, Sir Geoffrey Howe, I don't know who it was. Francis Pym? Um, possibly Francis Pym taking over. I think you would have had uh, um, a, a desperate series of encounters with the Americans uh, who would have said, look, we backed you in this and the assumption that you were going to win. Um, although we were not, um, so to speak, standing alongside you in the front line, uh, 
Um, we did, and um, Al Haig and others did actually lay their reputation to a certain extent on the line. Um, we've all, all suffered a humiliation at the hands of this, this dreadful man. Um, uh, I think we'd better review some of our joint security arrangements. I often wonder whether it would have affected the Warsaw Pact and their attitudes if we had failed. And this would have been a, uh, an indication of the decadence of Western thinking and behaviour, as opposed to what did happen, which showed that we were a lot tougher than they perhaps had thought we were by their doctrine and, and general thinking. This isn't my area of expertise, the political side, but I just have a feeling that it, this was... Um, the fact that it succeeded was of some help in the nato warsaw Pact confrontation and the superpower confrontation, and therefore, by corollary, if it had gone the other way, it would probably have been by no means any help. Well, uh, you're the editor of The Times. What would the press have said? The press were fairly robust on this war. Uh, I th or most of the press, uh, mercifully in this country, we have, <laughs> we have many views in the press, but on the whole, they were for this one. I think the press would have said, as they said in the case of Sheffield, um, what a disaster, um, but let's just see whether this is still a going concern. Um, I think, as you saw, uh, really ever since the war, whenever British troops have been engaged, uh, you do see, for better or for worse, and I think it's for better, a closing of ranks, even among the most sceptical and cynical of media people. And I think that would have happened under these circumstances. Um, the press were pretty hostile when the Argentinians invaded the Falklands. I mean, very hostile. Uh, and I think with good reason. I think there were a lot of, a lot of culpability around over that invasion, people, many of whom got off scot-free. Um, and uh, the press were perfectly clear that they were going to attack those people they felt should be attacked. As soon as the task force sailed, that stopped. And I think that, that would have continued right through to the time when they'd got back, even got back in defeat. And then the recriminations would have started. Well, what about the effect on the armed forces? I think the armed forces would have been very bad news indeed. I mean, apart from the, the loss of life involved, which is very personal and very worrisome, on the grander scale, um, the Navy and all the people involved with this operation um, now have a major military de defeat to, to live with. So it doesn't do us any good as a, a military service. And it certainly puts the government out of power. I mean, interestingly, you haven't mentioned anything about a, another election, but it would seem to me there's a vote of confidence, and they'd probably lose it. So there is an election. Yes. Well, uh, well let, 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 let's, let, let's subtract the Falklands effect from British politics, because we've lost, and there is no Falklands effect in a positive sense. There is a Falklands effect in a very powerful negative sense. So what's the likely outcome for the next election? The Conservatives have been humiliated. Labour is still stuck with a manifesto absolutely calculated, though not intentionally, for electoral defeat. So isn't the loss of the Falklands War the moment of opportunity for David Steele and David Owen? Well, uh, it was their period of maximum um, sort of thrust in the centre of the political stage. You're right. Um, it's possible that you could have got a, um, a, a hung parliament um, in 83, let's say, 84, 83, uh, and that that hung parliament could have led to um, uh, proportional representation. I don't actually think that would have been the case myself. Um, I think you'd have found the, um, the coalition of the two major parties would have been too great to get that one through. And ultimately, they would have had a power of, 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 of veto over it, albeit going back to the, going back to the election. Let, let's have your best guess for the election result that follows the Falklands, 1983 or well, 1984? Well, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, there's a lot of debate about what is the Falklands effect. I think the Falklands effect was quite dramatic. I think it established Mrs. Thatcher as a considerable politician rather than being a factional politician. And I think the change that made to the Tory party's fortunes from, from mid-82 onwards was mm -hmm. seismic uh, and made her victory in 83 inevitable. But let's say for the sake of argument that that hadn't been achieved. You did have an upturn in the economy beginning in, in early 82. That upturn was becoming quite considerable and was being aided by quite expansionist economic policies into 83. I mean, there was a real pre-election boom in 83. Uh, you would have had um, probably a new Tory leader, because I think Mrs Thatcher would by then have gone. You would have had a party um, with a defeat behind it, uh, and this after all is the Suez story. Uh, a new leader, an improving economy, and an opposition thinking it was going to win still led by Michael Foote, for the sake of the argument. I don't think it's by any sense uh, certain that the Tories would have lost. 
So what General Galtieri could have done for British politics would have been to produce the first Pym government or the first Howe government. Yes, I think that is possible. Mm. Or possibly so, even the first central government, proportional representation, a completely different political scene to what we now have. I think that's less that's rather, likely. I think, I think, I think that's, that's less likely. likely. And I also think... It's a major change. If, you, you, I mean, if you're positing a, a major hangar fire in Hermes, causing a complete political change in this country, it's quite a consequence. But it's a feasible line to take. Well, let's move on to national morale in the real world, which we've left behind, and which for the moment doesn't exist. Margaret Thatcher says after the Falklands War, we have ceased to be a nation in retreat. We have instead a newfound confidence. That didn't happen. We've been defeated. What would defeat have done to national morale? Um, that's more difficult for me to say. Um, much easier for me to answer for naval morale, if you like, which of course would have been extremely bad indeed. We had been very badly hit by the 1981 Defence Review, which, which took a very large bite out of the Navy, but those measures had not been taken in 82, so the naval capability was still residual from, from policies of before. Uh, and 1982 effectively turned round that government policy, or at least it did until um, fairly recently, as far as we can make out. Um, I.e., 1982 largely saved the Navy's bacon, which had been lost in the 1981 Defence Review. So there's a, a substantial effect for the Navy, because not only would it have lost the war, um, it would have lost a, a lot of equipment and people in it, um, and the 1981 Defence Review would have stood, possibly you... accelerated. I'm not so sure that the phrase national morale is um, a as cataclysmic a phrase as uh, it's often taken to be, and secondly, that it's wholly unsusceptible to political leadership. Um, I think that uh, American national morale suffered um, horrendous blows in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and somehow America came through now to win the Cold War. Um, I think that uh, British national morale took uh, an appalling knock at Suez, it went on to elect two conservative governments. Um, I think, I have to say, even within the context of the military, um, we've been suffering um, a running defeat, frankly, in Northern Ireland for 10, 15, 20 years now. Uh, at least we haven't won uh, in the terms that ministers declare victory um, or, or the character of victory. Uh, somehow or other, it hasn't affected national morale. Politicians and public have a way of, um, of, of blocking off bad news. Yeah. And I think the Falklands would have been regarded as um, Mrs. Thatcher's aberration. I think it would have been, it would have been dismissed as being um, a silly post-imperial adventure, as indeed many people still dismiss it. Sandy Woodward, it's 1991. We lost the Falklands War in 1982, and the Falkland Islanders are under Argentinian rule. What do you think it will be like for them? I do remember talking to one of the people who uh, kept sheep at that amazing island called Bleecker Island down in, in Lafonia. It couldn't have been much bleaker, that's for sure. He lived there with his wife and 2,300 sheep. A boat came to visit them every six weeks, whether they needed it or not. And that was really their only contact with civilization, if that's what you call it, um, barring the radio. And I said to him, asked him that remarkably silly question, so many of us did, well, if I offered you half a million pounds and a large slice of good acreage in South Island, New Zealand, which we could buy with easily enough, would you take it? No, he said, I live here. And that's the fact that I don't know whether you can get rid of it. He lived there, he's third generation island, and I don't know that he could be bought out. He was in no doubt in answering my question, but that was after the battle. If the Falklands conflict had ended in defeat, many would doubtless have said that the task force was doomed from the start, that post-imperial Britain could not hope to win a war 8,000 miles from home against an opponent armed with modern weapons. The war ended, however, not in disaster, but in a famous victory. No one who lived through the Falklands conflict is likely to forget hearing this news, which came from Brian Hanrahan with the British forces. The commander of the British Land Forces, Major General Jeremy Moore, made a hazardous nighttime flight through a snowstorm to negotiate the surrender at Port Stanley. Afterwards, he sent this message to London and to the Naval Task Force commanders. 
in Port Stanley at 9 p.m. Falkland time, tonight, the 14th of June. Major General Menendez surrendered to me all Argentine armed forces in East and West Falkland together with their impedimenta. The statement ended, the Falkland Islands are once more under the government desired by their inhabitants. God save the Queen. What If was presented by Dr. Christopher Andrew and produced in BBC Pebble Mill by Ian Bell.